or a plane to get to Fairfax. Um, what was I doing? Uh, well, we have gospel auditions going on in, the, in, in New York. So it's going to happen. And, well, we'll see. At least the, there'll be actors who can be out of work if it doesn't happen, I guess. Um, and yeah, I don't know, just stuff, meetings and dealing with the opera publishing and yeah, yeah. a bunch of stuff. And then today, good thing, was that um, the, uh, myself and Ralph Sevish and David Foe, who are the heads of business affairs for the Guild, um, went over and met with the people from the Copyright Office to talk about some um, questions that, that we have. And um, I kind of had expected that meeting to be a little chilly with us sort of complaining and then being defensive. And it was exactly the opposite. They were fantastic. And there were some new people there that um, I thought were terrific. Um, and you know, we realized we're all on the same side. And we want to be protecting, both protecting writers and also making things easier for writers. So, um, and, and they seemed at least as dedicated to trying to achieve that as, as we are. So um, that was very good. So that's what I was doing immediately before this. That's amazing. In addition to churning out amazing things that entertain and delight us, he's also our biggest ambassador and advocate as playwrights. Um, you head up the council, you're constantly out there doing things like this for us. And so please, show your gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that um, we have been trying quite consciously at the Guild to do um, over the last few years especially, and I give a lot of credit for this to Gary Garrison, is to become much more of a national organization and to be able to be there for people um, around the country, writers and playwrights, composers and lyricists around the country who are, who are writing theater, really to, be, uh, to become the organization that, that speaks for you, that defends you, that when you have questions about things, you have someone to ask about it. Um, when you need some legal advice, there's someone you can ask about when you need to know how, how things work or you need a defender, that there's a, a place to go, etc. cetera. And um, the Guild has always been, I think, a terrific organization, but um, it, it has been in the past um, you know, somewhat New, New York-centric. And this is something that we've all been really striving, hey Kevin, assiduously uh, to, to uh, correct, uh, maybe is, that's the correct word. And, um, and that's why I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad to see so many people from so many different locations. And we will continue to strive to, uh, to be there for you and, and be of service to you and just try and help you in, in every way to do what you're trying to do, which is to, um, to write theater. That's so cool. So talk a little bit about Godspell, one of my five favorite Stephen Schwartz musicals. <laughs> what, what's it like to revisit it after all these years? I mean, you wrote it when you were, what, seven? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the truth is that, that Godspell, I didn't really write it at all in the sense that Godspell was the um, brainchild of its original uh, conceiver and director, John Michael Teblak. And, and I actually came into the process uh, somewhat belatedly. Um, the show was quite well formed by the time um, I became involved with it. And um, in addition to uh, adding the, the music, um, and just how we structured it a little bit, basically um, having seen what John Michael had done, you know, I sort of uh, jumped on, on board the ship. Um, the nice thing for me about, about Godspell and a, a couple of other uh, shows of mine is that every time you see it, it's different because it's designed to be within its framework to be created by the company putting it on. So um, the actors and the director, uh, you know, get together and sometimes there are very interesting concepts and sometimes um, little out there concepts that may not work quite so well. And uh, so, but it's always interesting to me to see because, as I say. Um, it's, it's always going to be different, and, and that will be true um, if this revival does indeed come together. Um, that will be true of this as well. You know, I don't really 
know what it's going to be, but uh, we'll get a bunch of good people together and see, see what happens. Okay, what can you tell us that nobody else knows, including the readers of Playbill.com? <laughs> Give us an exclusive. Oh, gosh. Who's directing? Oh, well, is that, did they not know that? I don't know. I don't know that. Um, the director is a guy named Danny Goldstein, who did a production at Paper Mill a few years ago that I saw that I liked very much. And it's going to be at Circle in the Square. Uh, Ken Davenport, who produced Alter Boys, is producing. And uh, Charlie Alterman, who's a terrific musical director, who just uh, came off of Next to Normal, is, is uh, being a musical director. And it will have all new arrangements. Um, working with a terrific arranger named Michael Holland, who's done a lot of work with my son Scott, but he's basically a pop guy. And uh, yeah, I can't tell you anything about the cast because I don't know who it is yet. So are you, are you going back and revisiting the material at yeah, all? Yeah, there's a little bit of, I, I did one new tiny little um, musical thing to sort of bridge uh, the song Learn Your Lessons Well, which w has always been in two parts. And there's, it's, it's been reconceived anyway. And there was this little thing in the middle um, that I just that I musicalized, so that would be fun. And actually, one of the uh, actors that we're talking to um, potentially to play the lead has been asking about a new song, and he has an interesting idea. So, um, if he winds up doing it, I might write something new for him. Wow! If he doesn't, probably forget that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a second session tomorrow where Stephen's going to be sitting at the piano, and you will not want to miss it. Miss everything else tomorrow. <laughs> Be here. I promise you. Well, we're going to talk about musical theater structure and um, sort of some things that I've learned along the way. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a bunch of stuff. All of, I, I'll say this again tomorrow. You know, I realized as I was sort of making this list of different things to think about as one is working on a musical that there are virtually everything I'm going to say I can think of many exceptions, successful exceptions, including in my own work, but I'll say them anyway. And, you know, we can answer some questions and, yeah, so on. So, yeah, we'll be talking specifically about structuring uh, musical theater and things to think about in terms of when, when you're writing a musical. That's going to be great. A friend of mine who hates everything <laughs> wrote a Facebook page uh, posting about having the most wonderful evening at the opera. Oh, and I wow. think you have a little something to do with that. Um, tell us about your, your first major foray. How many people know that Stephen wrote a great opera called Seance on a Wet Afternoon? Oh, thank you, guys. How many people saw it? God Wow, love you. OK. Very dark, wasn't it? It was so nice to be able to really go to a dark place. Um, you know, uh, and a couple of people I remember when it premiered out in California in Santa Barbara. And, um, a couple of people, you know, talked to me afterwards, and they were sort of upset by what happened. And I just said, "Well, you know, it's, it's opera. Bad things happen." <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, it, it was a very um, extremely steep learning curve for me. Um, you know, very. I, I learned a, a ton about. Uh, legitimate voices and, and writing for them, which is uh, quite different, actually, than writing for pop or theater voices. Um, you know, pop voices and, and theater voices, you guys know who are um, composers or, or work with musical theater actors, tends to be a certain range and, you know, they kind of go to the top of their range and that's it. And um, legit voices, particularly sopranos and tenors, have this, like, little section called the passaggio, which is a couple of notes where they're not very happy sitting, and then they go up above that, and they're happy again. So um, just learning about that and, and vocal placement, and you know, the, it, was, it was very, very technical, um, which I, I quite enjoyed. And also doing um, orchestrations, because for musical theater, one tends not to do one's own orchestrations, unless it's a little band like Godspell. Um, but if you're dealing with a uh, you know, a pit orchestra, just the way musical theater gets created, there's no real time, even if you could orchestrate it, to do it. Um, and then opera, of course, that's part of the job. So I spent a year <coughs> sitting in front of a computer with a Sibelius program orchestrating and <laughs> my eyes crossing and just learned a, a whole bunch. I don't know if I'll ever put it into practice again, but it was, uh, it was very, very interesting. And I worked with um, Bill Brown, William David Brown, who was the, uh, my orchestrator on Wicked. And he just very graciously 
spent uh, spent a year with me, basically being wow. a, an, an orchestration mentor. So, was it hard to turn off the composer brain when you were in orchestration mode? Well, no, because it's part of the same thing, and also I, I it was conceived to be you know I sort of had the orchestration in mind as I was as I was writing anyway. Um, no, and that's the thing. I feel that uh, writing for opera, the part of the job, as I say, is, is to conceive it orchestrally, which is different, frankly, than, than uh, at least when I write for musical theater, I basically, it's, it's basically pianistic. You know, I'm basically working from a keyboard, and it, ultimately it does get orchestrated, but I, I always think it's, it's pretty clear that it all got, you know, it all started on piano, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Occasionally a couple of guitar things sneak in there, but mostly it's, it's very keyboard oriented. Are you a guitar player too? I, I used to be a guitar player. Uh, now, you know, I'm so lazy that, uh, you know, now you can play guitar and keyboard so as long as you, and make it sound like that, so as long as you know how it works, um, you know, you can kind of do that. But when I was a kid, I was a guitar player as well. Was that your first instrument? Or no, was no, it no, piano? no, okay. piano, but, um, you know, played classical guitar as well um, in, in, in high school and kind of folk guitar and blues guitar and, yeah. Oh, wow. Now I can't, you know, I can't make a bar chord anymore, so. <laughs> What you may, I, we all know he wrote a little show called Wicked, <laughs> but what I was surprised to find out that you were really the catalyst for making this all happen, and I think that's an interesting story, if you wouldn't mind sharing. Well, no, no, I don't mind at all. I mean, yeah, what, what happened um, was that in an extremely man, r random way, um, I was, it, it, it was a social occasion, basically, I was on a snorkeling trip with friends. <laughs> Uh, and um, on the boat on the way back from puddling around in Malakini, um, a friend of mine, the folk singer Holly Neer, just making casual conversation said, um, well, I'm reading this really interesting book and it's called Wicked and it's by this guy named Gregory McGuire and basically it's the Oz story from the Wicked Witch's point of view. And Every time I say that, I get goosebumps. You can't see it now because I'm wearing a my jacket. And I just thought that, that it was the best idea I had ever heard in my life. Um, and that it was, it was so me. It was, it, so many things about it were, were right for what I like to do. And I was out in California at the time doing movies and not really thinking much about doing theater again. And, uh, and then I heard that idea. And I just thought that I... I really had to do that if I could get a chance. So then uh, I got back to Los Angeles the next day, and I called my lawyer and I said, "Okay, there's you know there's this book out there called Wicked, and it's been out for a while. So somebody has the rights. So can you find out who has the rights? And I'm going to go get the book and see. Um, but but I think I have to do this if I can. And then it, I got very very lucky because it turned out that um, the rights were held by Universal Pictures. And um, Mark Platt was the head of Universal at the time. And um, I sort of worked my way up the food chain, you know, having various meetings with underlings until I could get a meeting with Mark. And um, I knew they were in the process of trying to adapt it as a non-musical movie. They had, there was a, a first draft of a screenplay was done. They had given their notes. They, were, they had paid for it. Uh, paid quite a lot for it. They were waiting for the second draft to come back. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got a meeting with Mark and I went in there knowing that I was going to try and talk him out of that. Um, so with great trepidation, I walked into the office and when I walked in, he sang Corner of the Sky to me. Um, because it turned out that he had been in Pippin in college. So, I mean, really, a studio executive in Hollywood, can you imagine if it had been Warner Brothers, there would never have been a show. So I was just really, really got lucky. Yeah, and I basically talked to Mark and said, look, I know you're doing this, trying to do this as a movie. Um, I don't really think it's going to work as a movie. These are the reasons I don't think it's going to work. I think it needs to be uh, a musical, and in fact, I think it needs to be a stage musical. These are the reasons I feel that, and, and I really think I know how to do this, and I really want to do it, so please give me the chance. And it's not as if he said immediately, why, you're right, of course, my boy. <laughs> but um, but F, over, over time, uh, eventually he came around, yeah. That's so great. But you still had to pitch a little bit, right? Didn't you have to do a song or two and sort of 
sell them on the idea? No, actually. No? Um, basically what happened was he started developing it on parallel tracks. He mm -hmm. said, well, we'll, you know, um, we'll see. I've given, they got the second draft in from the screenplay and he still had some reservations and he gave some notes. In the meantime, um, Winnie, Winnie, I asked Winnie Holtzman to work with me on it and she and I you know, started working out an outline and meeting with Mark and then just gradually the movie fell away. Yeah, relatively early in the process, um, you know, I'd done some songs and, and uh, kind of pitched them to, to Universal and I suppose at any point Universal could have dropped out. Um, and, but, the, but the deal was, frankly, cause, and this is actually useful for us to talk about um, as, as writers, I didn't want to um, be wasting my time, obviously, if I was writing. So the deal was that as long as Universal was willing to back the movie, um, they had the rights to do that. But if they, I, of course, first of all, let me back up. First of all, I had to go to the writer of the underlying rights, Gregory McGuire. Um, that was the most important thing. And tell him what I had in mind and, and basically get the rights to do it. Um, so that's the first thing. If you're adapting something, that uh, is based on something else. If it's a derivative work, if there are underlying rights, get the rights. Sometimes you will have to do some, some spec work. Um, you will have to write a song or two or three or an outline or something. But I just know of so many sad, sad stories of people who've done full adaptations and very good ones. I know of one in particular, a terrific adaptation that was in um, my ASCAP workshop by a composer lyricist team that have gone on to be quite well known. And they worked on it for two years, and everybody was very enthusiastic about it, and they had producers, and they finally went to the, the, uh, the guy who wrote the movie, and he wouldn't give them the rights, because um, he just didn't want it to be a musical, and that was the end of that. So don't do that. Get the rights. Um, and then having done that, um, as I said, the deal was that uh, if Universal decided to back out, by this point, the movie had kind of gone away. Then they could, but if they did, then the rights to continue went to Mark, who, um, who, was good, who would produce it. And if Mark backed out, then the rights came to me. So that, um, you know, so that, so that it could, at least I'd have the chance to try to move it forward, even if they, um, if they went away. But, um, but they were amazing. They were wonderfully supportive all the way through, and, they never went away, so. Lucky for us. Yeah, Lucky So for me. So that was the mm -hmm. best idea you've ever heard for a musical. What's the <laughs> worst? <laughs> oh, gosh. And was it yours? Mm, uh, well, actually, I mean, what I want to say is that the worst idea I've ever heard for a musical is 1776, which is one <laughs> of my favorite musicals. <laughs> so it, 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 I mean, the point being that Somebody else can have an idea that you hear it and you just think, that's really a bad idea. <laughs> a musical about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> a bunch of guys in silly costumes <laughs> where you know the end. <laughs> what a bad idea. But then what happens is, you know, somebody was passionate about it, someone had a vision. Um, and, you know, had, had a way to do it that, that made it wonderful, which, which in a way I think demonstrates that it's really, I don't think it really is that there are good ideas and bad ideas, it's that there's an idea that sparks you and that you have a vision for, um, that you care about. I, I really feel that somebody has to really be passionate about a musical. I mean, a play, of course, it goes without saying, because it's an individual and you wouldn't be writing it if you weren't, you know, passionate enough about it to, to, to do the silly thing of writing a play. Um, but a, a musical which can be more collaborative and people can get brought in on it, I still feel like there needs to be one, at least one person who, who, who germinated it, who really cares about it. Recently, I've, I, I, I won't name it, but I, I saw a musical um, one of this year's crop of musicals um, on Broadway. And uh, it's really well done. And, but I just couldn't care about it at all. And I just knew that everybody working on it really didn't give a damn. 
It was just an assignment, and you could feel it. Even though they did their work extremely competently, and it was all very well designed and staged and acted and written and just, because there was, you could sense the lack of passion. Yeah. How do you find somebody who shares your passion? Because I know we've had exchanges where we try to hook up uh, playwrights with composers, and somebody's baby isn't always somebody else's baby. So have you, have you ever encountered that? Where you oh, sure, constantly. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great question, and it's, I mean, it's something those of us who are collaborative writers, who don't do it all ourselves, who aren't um, playwrights who, you know, go into a room and come out with at least a first draft of a play, um, that putting together the team to do it is so tricky and, um, yes, and so important. And, and I, yeah, there have been many times where there have been, um, there's been something I wanted to do, and there have been writers that I thought, oh, he or she would be great for this, and I've talked to them about it, and they just are not interested, and they don't see it. And sometimes the project goes away because of that. I mean, there have been a couple of things where, you know, I was really interested in a project, and I just couldn't find somebody to work with me on it. Um, and then in other cases, you keep trying, and the second or third person, or fourth person, or whatever you talk to, um, gets it, you know, and, and says, oh yeah, I love that idea. Um, I was lucky in the case of Wicked because um, Winnie, who was my first choice, um, was very excited about it as well. So that was lucky, but that's not, that's not always the case. I mean, with Pippin, I talked to a whole bunch of writers before um, finally sort of being match-made, put together with, with Roger Herson. Um, who, who I didn't, whose work I didn't know until it was suggested to me, and then he sort of got, um, you know, what I was, what I, what I had in mind, um, and then took it a whole place beyond which um, I could even have seen at the time. So yeah, but that's that's a tricky thing because I think it's a combination of things. You you want to find some first of all, you want to find someone whose work you like, and who feels to you, if you are the one looking for a collaborator, then you want to find someone whose work feels to you like good casting for this piece. And, you know, not everybody is good casting for everything. I'm certainly not good casting for, um, for everything. You know, there, there are certain things that I do and respond to and certain things that I don't, or even if I tried, I wouldn't be very good at. And, and that's true of all writers. So I think that's the first thing. And then, as you say, Larry, um, then you have to be lucky enough that the writer actually responds to the, uh, to the material and thirdly, you have to be able to find a shared vision. And that's the trickiest thing of all, particularly if it's something starting with you, um, because it's never going to be what you had in your head. Um, frankly, it, it never will be the minute somebody, the minute you have a director anyway, it's not going to be what you had in your head. Um, and that's a good thing, but it's a tough thing. And, and learning how or, or you, don't, you never really learn how to do this, but, but coming to some realization of what, where you can give up, or, or what battles to fight, or when to be open to an idea that's maybe better than what you had, but where you have to, where you have to draw the line and say, no, 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 no. If we do that, that changes the whole essence of it. That's so tricky, um, and, and, it, and it's a struggle. Or, or a challenge, I shouldn't say it's a struggle, but it's definitely a challenge on any collaborative project. So the whole issue of collaboration is, is very complicated. But you wear a lot of different hats when you're collaborating. Sometimes you're writing the music, sometimes you're doing the lyrics. Um, how has that all worked out in the beginning? When you sit down for the first time, everybody's in the room. Well, usually... Are there rules? That do you, are you talking about process or who's doing what? Well, I guess more conflict resolution than anything, you know. Oh, well, I mean, I've always been pretty fortunate in getting along with, I, with, with the, my, my um, writing collaborators. Um, that, uh, and, and part of it is because I feel that um, collaboration, there's always another solution. So that if you are doing something, and your collaborator, assuming that you like and respect your collaborator, um, and if he or she just doesn't get what you're doing or doesn't like what you're doing, 
then I feel like, well, you, you, you try again. Um, and you try and come up with something else. And you expect them to do the same. So there really is a conflict in that way. I mean, I have had uh, occasions, for instance, working with Alan Macon, where I've done um, you know, a, a lyric or part of a lyric that, that he hasn't been crazy about. And if I really believe in it, I'll just ask him to live with it for a while. But um, if he still doesn't like it, I'll change it. I'll, I'll tell you a good story about I've told this a bit, so I, stop me if you've heard this. <laughs> <laughs> So the first song that Alan Macon and I wrote together was um, Colors of the Wind for Pocahontas. We'd never worked together before, though we had known each other personally and were kind of social friends. And um, the song was done, and Disney had, was very enthusiastic about it. And we were, we were, I think, like two or three days before we were going into the studio to record it. And for animation, once you record something, it's done. You know, it's just so expensive, and they start drawing, and it, it's done. So you have to have a right then. Um, and Alan called me, I think, two days before, and he said, listen, I know everybody loves this song, and I love the song, and I think it's terrifically clear. I, I just don't like the ending. There are these, I, it just has been bothering me and bothering me, and we don't really know each other that well, and so I, I just haven't said anything, but I, I, I just have to say something. And I just don't like it. So here's what the last three lines of Colors of the Wind were. She sang, um, I'm so embarrassed to say this because they're really bad. Uh, <laughs> she sang, for your life's an empty hull, till you get it through your skull, you can pay with all the colors of the wind. And Alan just said, I just don't like that word skull in this song. I don't think it belongs and Hull is too fancy, and I went into this elaborate explanation about how difficult it was to rhyme colors, and there were very few things, and the triple rhyme, and I went on and on, and then finally I thought, well, he's my collaborator, I'll, I'll, I'll just try to come up with, with, with something else, and I struggled, and you know, took out a rhyming dictionary and looked up rhymes for all, and I just was like, nowhere, nowhere. And finally, uh, I, I just abandoned the triple rhyme. I just thought, well, I can't do it, so it'll just, I just won't do it at all. And almost walking into the studio, um, I did, uh, you can own the earth and still, all you'll own is earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind. So much better, so much better. Um, and that's because my collaborator just didn't like the other thing, but I probably would have, you know, been lazy enough to leave it. So um, that's what I mean. That's the point. It's just is knowing, is listening, and being willing to change everything, anything. I mean, um, you know, John Caird was the one who said to me, "There's always another solution," um, it, and uh, so I think that's significant in, in working with a collaborator. And that doesn't mean to be a doormat you know, or just change anything. You know, if you really believe in something, make your case for it, ask your collaborator to, to live with it for a while because sometimes they, they grow to like it or sometimes they come to see it from your point of view. But um, in the end, I think, you know, you need to be willing to look for another solution. Um, I find that the collaboration between writers and director, that's a more fraught um, collaboration. Um, and there is, I think, inherently built into that um, a certain degree of, of conflict, which I, I think is actually, as I say, a good thing for the show, though it's not always fun um, while it's happening. Um, but, but between, because there sometimes you really have to stand your ground, and sometimes you really have to say, I really don't like what you're doing there, and they get mad at you, and you get mad at them. Um, but even there, you really, you really want to try to um, have as much give and take as you can. But, but Collaborating with your fellow writers, I think, you know, it's a cliche to say that it's like a marriage, but, but it kind of is, you know, it's kind of like bringing up the kids, and you want to, um, you want to agree on how to do that. Um, I saw you drink, and I mean, yeah, I, I like, I don't have to say, but I just stopped. Uh, <laughs> used to be mischievous. <laughs> on the topic of songwriting. What makes a good musical theater song to you? Well, I'm going to talk about this some more tomorrow. Okay. Um, but, no, but Give I'll say, um, 
This how, about a, how about a musical theater moment rather than a song? Well, like, here's a good place for a song. Well, uh, uh, well that's interesting. Um, that's very instinctive, the choice of where to write, of what to musicalize. Um, I had an interesting conversation a couple of months ago. I was on, I was on an opera panel, uh, or a panel um, that was about the difference between musical theater and opera, and, um, and there were all sorts of, like, Adam Gettle was on the panel, and John Kander, and Rufus Wainwright, and basically we all blathered on and, and came to the conclusion that it was just a continuum and there wasn't really a difference and all the stuff. And then after the panel, um, Oscar Hammerstein's son, Andy Hammerstein, uh, was, was there and we were talking because I used the example of the first scene of Carousel and how everything that I had to say about what I thought constituted writing opera was contained in the first scene of Carousel and yet I knew it wasn't an opera and so anything I had to say was pretty invalid, frankly. Um, so anyway, we were talking about that afterwards and he said a really interesting thing. He said, well, isn't it really like the decision in a musical is what to sing, and the decision in an opera is what not to sing, which I thought was so smart. I just wish he'd said it in the panel. But that being said, that you should being, just say it. Just take well, it. Well, I did. It. I did. I, you know, after a while, I'll just pretend I thought of it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he doesn't know. Rewind the tape, will tell him that, that I said that. Um, but the point is that that decision of what to sing is is really key. In, in terms of storytelling and, um, and the degree to which you want to be storytelling. Because when you sing, it does something interesting to time. It can stretch it so that you take a moment that in dialogue would be 20 seconds and it's now three and a half minutes, or it can speed it along and you take something that would take you five scenes to do and you do it in, um, in a five minute number and so on, um, and, it, and it focuses attention on something, it announces that this is important, pay attention to this moment from a storytelling point of view because we're bothering to sing about it, and, and all sorts of other things. So that decision of what to sing and what not to sing is very, very key, I think. Um, and, and as I said, we're going we're gonna to talk about it a lot. Uh, I'm going to talk about it at length tomorrow. Um, but. Having said that, for me, it, it, although I'm going to talk a lot about different rules and things, there really are no rules. It's completely instinctive. And um, you know, for instance, working on the Disney films, it was the first time that I encountered a, 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 a process that I find very helpful structurally, which is, which is storyboarding, um, if, you're, if you're doing a musical. And by that, I don't mean the storyboarding where you draw little pictures about, you know, the camera's going to do this and the camera's going to do that. But, but sort of an, it's, 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 it's an outline on the bulletin board. And, um, and as opposed to an out, you know, having an outline of like, this happens and that happens when you're turning the pages, there's something about seeing it up there that I find very helpful in terms of um, seeing the structure. And the, and the way they did it at Disney, which I think may have been created by Howard Ashman, I don't know, but by the time I got there, they were doing it, was they would take a great big bulletin board and note cards, like four by six cards or three by five cards. And on each three by five card would be the most basic uh, description of the story beat. Like it, in Wicked, we had a card that said, um, Alphabet and Glinda meet at school. They don't like each other. They are forced to be roommates. Card. You know, things like that. Just none of the specifics, just the story beat, what's happening. Um, and then you sort of put it up there, and one of the things is if you look at it, and, and, and with, with no attention at, 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 the, at first as to what's sung and what's not. And if you start to look at it, you can see, oh, wait a minute, you know, card 5 over here and card 18 over here, I see they're the exact same thing. So something's wrong with my structure. So you can, you can sort of see a skeleton and see that, that things are moving forward, that you're not circling back on yourself or, or repeating yourself. Then having done that, um, I found that we would look at these cards and almost immediately, and, and particularly if I was working with Alan, we'd both be together and we would be like, that's a song. 
I don't know why, and it would come off, the white card would come off, and the same thing that was on the card would be written on a blue card, and then a blue card would be put up there. And then after a while, you could sort of, again, see the shape of, of how things flowed, and if there were too many white cards in a row, that was not good, and if there were like a whole bunch of white cards and then a whole bunch of blue cards, that wasn't good. And you just got a sense of the, of, of the ebb and flow of it. And I, I found that very useful, but the, the, the point is that I don't know why you would, you know, why we would just look at something and, and say like, oh well, that, that moment is a musical moment, but that, that's instinctive. That, you know, that's instinct. And people will make different choices. I mean, one of the things that's, um, that, w that was, uh, I, I always think of this because, um, you know, a, a very, very successful musical um, by Stephen Sondheim is a little night music. And, and people love that show. I mean, it has great music. I think there's a huge structural flaw in the show because the leading character, Desiree, I have no idea what she wants for a really, really long time. And then finally she sings, you know, one of the best songs ever written at the end. But meanwhile, where is she at the beginning? So I keep thinking, like, there's a missing song. Somewhere in that first three or four numbers, I need to hear from her. You know, more than just as part of, like, this glamorous life song. Obviously, uh, this show seemed to do just fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I were doing that show, instinctively, I would put a song for her somewhere in there. And, you know, who knows if that would have been better or worse or feel predictable or whatever. But my point is that my instinct is, di would be, is different than, in, in, in this case, you sometimes instinct. And it doesn't mean that one is right and one is not. It's just, you, you just follow that. Do you nail down all your structure first and then go into songwriting? Or sometimes is it just, I got to write this song. I know it's going to work. I try, you try to nail down a structure. With the, uh, with the, I, I try to nail down the structure with the understanding that it's going to change um, to some extent. Certainly the specifics will change, though oddly enough the, the basic structure, if you have it right, often doesn't change very much. Um, because again, it's, you know, I'm, it, it's just I, being lazy. I don't want, I, you wind up writing a bunch of songs that you throw out anyway. So, but give yourself the best shot, you know. Don't be writing a song for, uh, for a moment that doesn't belong in the show, and you write the best song of all time, and you can't use it in the show, because the, the moment doesn't work. At least the songs that I'm throwing out, um, I would say 90%, if not 100% of them, are being thrown out because the song's not good enough, not because there's, the structural moment isn't, isn't there. So yeah, I want to try and get as much of a, a sense of what the structure is a, as possible um, before starting to write. But, um, you know, but obviously things are going to be happening as you're working on the, working on the piece. You're going to have musical ideas, you're going to have ideas for lyrics, you're going to have ideas for song titles, and, um, you know, so they'll start to accumulate. But, but I do tend to try to hold off writing um, until, I, until I kind of know what, what the structure is now. That being said, I'm going to say the exact opposite. Sometimes to find out what the show is, you have to, you have to write stuff. You have to be willing to write stuff that, you, that you're going to throw out. Because you just, you can't quite envision it. Um, I would think that's very true of, of, of playwriting. That, um, more so than musicals. Musicals are, are so structurally oriented and plays are, are so much, um, you, know, uh, you know, someone says something to someone and they reply and you're off, you know. Um, but, but even so, even with musicals, sometimes you just have to do some stuff and, and after a few months of doing this or whatever, you, you may have a whole bunch of stuff that, that's not working and you're struggling with, and then you suddenly say, oh, oh, that's what this show is, okay. So this all goes and now we start. And, and that's a perfectly, I think, you know, it's exhausting, but it's a perfectly legitimate process, but, um, but I do try to avoid that. So what happens when you throw them out? Where do they go? Um, usually they just go away. Um, I mean, there are, you know, there are very, very famous examples of writers who, particularly composers, um, who, have a, who have a really good tune, and, and it goes in the trunk, so to speak, and then it shows up again, um, you know, in something else. Uh, and, and I have some trunk songs that were, I have some songs in, in a couple of things that 
were that were music that I, I had from before. There's a there's a song in Wicked that uh, was um, basically, although I, I changed it a bit, but the basic music was a pop song that I'd written, you know, in the '70s, and I just always really liked the music and could never come up with a, a lyric. And other people tried to write lyrics for it and could never come up with anything that we liked. And then it seemed really appropriate for one moment if it, if it were altered a bit. But mostly. I, what I'm writing is so much for a particular moment and a particular character and a particular event that it just, you know, it doesn't it doesn't lend itself to to recycling too too often. We have time for three really great questions. That's so unfair. Choose your words wisely. You spoke about the delicacy of collaboration. Uh, you you've had the benefit of collaborating not just with interesting people, but with stars. Does that change the chemistry of collaborating? Do you have to bend a little more when it's a star director or a star actor? Or Well, they may. Uh, the, did everybody hear the question back there? OK. The question was, in collaborating with, quote, stars, does that sometimes change the, the temperature of the collaboration? Do you have to bend a little bit more if you're dealing with a star writer or a star director? Um, my experience is, and, and sort of my opinion is, no. Um, particularly with writers, that um, if, if you're collaborating with someone, um, then, then it doesn't matter you know, what, what they've done before um, or, or will do in the future. You know, you're dealing with this right now. I mean, when I was very young and I worked with Leonard Bernstein, uh, you know, there was an intimidation factor. But that wasn't his fault. That was my fault. And, and he did everything in his power to try to um, help me overcome that. And I think it was, it was largely successful at that. Star directors um, will bring an attitude in with them, and it just makes the situation even more fraught than it already is. But, um, you know, and, and again, most of the time people are stars for a reason. Um, and particularly writers and directors, much more so, I think, than actors and television personalities. There are very, very few writers and directors who are famous for being famous. You know, they're usually famous because they've done something worthy of, of note. And therefore, one brings a certain respect in, in terms of working with them, and um, uh, you know, you want to hear what they have to say within that context. But um, yeah, but I, th I think there's a difference between that and, and being in intimidated by um, by someone's reputation. Cool. Number two. Yes. Well, uh, Stephen, you were established as for writing music and lyrics, and then you taken on projects where you were only a lyricist, Bernstein, time and Ken Strauss. Uh, in that situation, do you, how do you deal with uh, your own music instincts um, well, the the way of working um, for the for the latter two was was different than um, the way I worked with with Lenny, and um, because I was sort of learning how to collaborate uh, with Lenny, and I made several mistakes. Um, I feel from a sort of craft point of view that that I wouldn't um, that I wouldn't make now, but. Um, with, with Charles Strauss uh, and, and with Alan, we almost always work music first. Um, part of that is out of my own laziness that I just want the other person to go first because then I, you know, I don't have to think of things as much. Um, I, so our process tends to be that I try and come up with a title. I, and even when I'm working on, on my own, I have come to find it very useful to, to find a title pretty, as fast as I can because it, it, it gives me so many parameters. Um, but um, yeah, so well, I'll just talk about with Alan. Um, for the most part, he likes me to be there when he's writing. I come in with a title and maybe a couple of lines that usually don't wind up in the song, just something to trigger something. And we sit in a room together and we talk about what the, the event of the song is and sort of the feel of it. And he writes at the piano. And a lot of times I just sit there and I'm drinking tea and you know, doing uh, the Harper's Puzzle or something, mm -hmm. and he'll be playing away and I'll just go like, oh, that, that's really good, you know, and, but, you know, sometimes he just comes up with something, and, um, and it's usually not the whole song, it's usually just something, 
and then um, I take it home and um, play it over and over again on the piano and try to internalize it and then try to get the silhouette of the lyrics to function with the silhouette of the music so that if there's a big emotional moment it the lyric has a big emotional word or a big emotional thought and if something's tripping along quickly then I'm trying to kind of trip along with it. In a way I feel that the job of the lyric is kind of to, to stay out of the way of the music and also to define the shape of the music. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 uh, they, because they tend to take the lead, I, I think it doesn't crimp their style too much. As I've said before, if there is something musically that, that I don't like, uh, you know, I'll say something about it or I'll say something like, uh, oh, like the song from, from Hunchback of Notre Dame out there, which was the first song that Alan and I wrote for that. He had the entire um, music before we, before we even started on the piece because it was something he had been noodling around with for Beauty and the Beast because it sounded French and then he wound, it up, he wound up not using it. And we basically took all the music except I asked him to change the title line because the original thing, I can't remember it exactly now, but it was kind of like, you know, out there, walking in the sun. It was very close together, and I just didn't feel it was memorable enough for the title on, and I said, can't you just do a, do a big interval or something? You know, so occasionally I will ask for things like that, but, um, you know, but again, if he, it, it, it's what I was saying with the collaborator, if he says, well, I really, this is the way that the music should be, you know, I'll, I'll be like, well, you know what? It's your music. I've, ex I've expressed my opinion, but in the end, you're the composer, so that's it. In the interest of gender parity, can we have a female member? I see of the a female member. Aha! Uh -huh. yes. yes. In fact, um, a genuine female. <laughs> <laughs>